My topic of today, external dimension of EU energy uh, and climate policy, as it has been already mentioned above. Well, understanding how the European Union as a growing regulatory superpower uses soft and hard law measures to shape energy and climate policies in the third countries, we will today dive into uh, some facets of Europeanization in the neighborhood and also particularly zoom in on the external applicability of EU energy and law policy in Southeast Europe. Well, to date, energy is no unitary policy meta, but rather a multi-dimensional material that cuts across numerous policy fields. Energy from being a word used by a small section of society has now become a hot topic. Thanks to the global policies on the environment and the climate change, a couple of things that have been mentioned by the moderator also in the beginning, or well, because of these many new attributes to energy law and some new concepts, emerging new concepts around it, such as, for example, energy justice, um, decarbonization now almost entirely substituting uh, um, the market liberalization, even on new governance elements, governance systems, uh, not only changes in the law, but the governance systems or just transition in general, let's say new greener legal framework of energy law is now becoming a new normal. But although many are therefore claiming that, that the next development phase of energy law under the so-called catchphrase energy law 2.0, is, is emerging to respond adequately energy transition challenges and low carbon economy in general. I believe it is still largely considered as a relatively new legal phenomenon emerging at a, uh, an, an accelerated pace, uh, receiving uh, a great deal of uh, um, attention in academic literature and also in practice. Um, I would say the same could apply to law of climate change as well. Um, that also arises uh, on the edges of the intersection of several other areas, such as, for example, environmental law, energy law, public international law, business law, if you may wish. And apart from covering the legal aspects of governing global warming and greenhouse gas stabilization, climate law now rather encompasses the broader, uh, I would say, social economic governance as well and, and regulates the issues related to the sustainable development. Well, notwithstanding the fact that uh, we are then now talking on one of the most, um, let's say, evolving trends in legal scholarship, uh, as put up uh, earlier above, we are not going to do, what we are not going to do today in this constellation is to define the key concepts of energy and climate law per se. Um, and I believe you intentionally brought with me in this thought because, well, not only because of assuming that there is some sort of good understanding on that in this virtual audience, but also for avoiding complicated discussions for this brilliant afternoon of June 29th, uh, which is pretty much also marking the final session of this um, fantastic webinar series, as uh, said uh, um, earlier. Then what we will instead do today is to address some of the open questions also posed by Dirk in the beginning, especially in the aftermath of newly negotiated European Green Deal as EU's latest climate action blueprint and much awaited decarbonization agenda or, or pathway, if you may wish. Um, and all this will be done, obviously, in the third country's context. Um, that is certainly also anything but easy, I believe, but uh, I hope we can give our best to arrive at a common understanding in this context on the matter that I want to uh, shed some light today. In any case, to put some flesh on the bones, um, we will use Georgia as a case study to reach the discussion with practical examples and also um, to gauge the Green Deal implications for the energy community contracting parties and to demonstrate how a um, particular law or rather a group of subject link, linked laws uh, can work within a certain geographical uh, scope or setting. Um, well, some of the thoughts of this kind can also be found in more elaborated manner in my latest publication in European Energy Environment and Law Review that has been released just a few days ago and very happy to, to let you know that and also very happy to receive your feedback and comments should you have one. Moving ahead then, um, 
and having all this said, let's start some of the with some of the theoretical, uh, let's say, underpinnings to map the state of the art today with regard to the EU energy and climate rules application in the third countries. Well, just to briefly conceptualize where we stand and what is the point of our departure, we may also need to devote a few words on the Europeanization process itself as well, uh, through which EU provides um, the so-called external governance, projects the model of the rules and also contributes to the development of uh, governance beyond the formal membership, beyond the formal members. Uh, of uh, of the of the uh, block, the EU thus enjoying uh, capacity to enter uh, into cross border relations, international relations, often refers to um, incentive uh, twin structure. Let's put it like this, which is called Europeanization, and it is usually um, applied between EU policymakers and stakeholders. Well, substantive goals as well as the instruments then of this Europeanization. Uh, mirror the principles of the EU integration itself, and that also, in my opinion, relates to the positive conditionality as well, which is, we can argue now, that uh, is not only a password in the EU's vocabulary or, or glossary today, but rather a toolbox um, in linking the states or benefits desired by certain states to the fulfillment of certain conditions. So basically the idea of diplomacy or development cooperation or trade very much kicks in here. So turning this now to energy, um, obviously this is one of those specific and, and complex fields at the EU's machinery with uh, shared competence where the decisions must be taken, of course, in accordance with subsidiarity and proportionality principles. Um, when it comes to its external application, um, since the founding treaties of the EU neither specify um, its extraterritorial application nor allocate uh, the external, like specific external competence in energy, it is an open question to what extent then the EU is actually able to expand the scope of its energy norms. I believe in this context, uh, general rules apply. Um, also, by virtue of the implied powers developed through um, the case law, through the Court of Justice, according to which whenever the exercise of the external powers uh, is necessary to obtain the objectives of the Union, then the EU is actually um, entitled to develop real external energy policy and some of the, the, the articles that um, needs to be invoked in this context, you can find on the uh, on the slide. Well, now trying to link this all to um, to the core part of my today's lecture, the EU tends uh, to expand the area of uh, factual application of the EU energy key and the ways and the methods uh, and the standards of uh, and the habits also uh, can be cultural habits also how a willing state. Um, regulates a new energy regulation is, of course, a free political choice. So it means that the national legislator, whether this is in Bosnia or in North Macedonia or in Georgia, where I'm present at the moment um, uh, and, and, and living actually, uh, may adopt any laws descended by the EU, but these laws uh, must also comply uh, with certain requirements and these requirements to be deeply embedded in the principles of the national legal system. So basically the constitutional, administrative, and whatever national legal concepts and principles um, come in place. Well, there's also um, good news that there are a number of specific instruments uh, offered by the EU itself to, um, let's say, smoothen down this process and for the EU, uh, and for this purpose, uh, uh, EU usually is actually using, uh, or creating, rather creating a network of a legal, political, and administrative obligations. So we have, um, we can also argue that there are also various complementary and targeted frameworks ranging from specific energy provisions of bilateral um, agreements with the third countries to multilateral treaties, of course, of regional, of, of regional and national scope, and that all should be taken into consideration when assessing this process. And one more important point, these regimes are usually characterized by um, very much differentiated legal force, veering from soft to hard law mechanisms, and therefore affect the energy markets to um, 
to a greater or lesser extent. The soft law instruments may be regarded as also, uh, let's say, preparatory uh, phases or steps uh, for the application of the EU energy legislation on this specific territory. European neighborhood policy can be named, is the partnership can be also named, which are usually um, uh, lagging behind when it comes to legal enforceability. But then we also have the stricter measures, such as association agreement, also providing uh, preferential access to the EU markets, often with a view, uh, a view to eventual entrance to the EU customs union. Uh, how feasible, how realistic, how timely, that's also another question coming up. Um, and most importantly, what I would like to stress is obviously energy community framework, um, serving as a successful model of this legally binding sectoral multilateralism, to, to, to call it like this, and of course, a key pillar of the external dimension of EU's energy lobbying policy. Um, it should also be considered as a um, hybrid legal space in which the, the normative framework or normative interaction between EU law, energy community framework itself, and the contracting party legal order and culture interplay, as some of the academics also, also believe, including the ones who have been also speaking in this webinar service previously, and uh, this is how and when we can also talk on uh, the principle of uh, homogeneity, so-called legal homogeneity of interpretation, Article 94 of the Energy Community Treaty to close the gap between the community law and the domestic legal system. Just for an example, um, the principle of homogeneity should provide a crucial law role in the implementation of the EU's third energy package in Georgia, with already a formal commitment in place, which later be compared with the fourth one, um, clean energy package. Um, and this set of laws, so the, the ones coming from the third energy package, are targeted, obviously, at achieving more competitive markets, and bundling energy suppliers from the not network operators, uh, promoting cross-border cooperation and transparency, increasing all this. So basically, the usual suspects that are let's say, uh, um, the, the part uh, of the energy transformation report, uh, uh, the reform in the countries of the energy community. Um, so if this is present or, or maybe even rather past, we might now need to look into the future, uh, compare old life with a new one, and uh, uh, what is basically nowadays called this future of the decarbonization, obviously the European Green Deal, as has been already mentioned in the beginning of this webinar series uh, of, of today's session. Why is that so? Because energy talks now in the contracting parties um, with certainly different standing points, obviously. Um, they all uh, have different uh, approaches, even how to implement the European Green Deal. But anyways, these talks, these energy, climate, environmental talks are at the moment geared towards potential upgrade to the EU's 2030 climate and energy targets and the specific implications brought by the European Green Deal. Um, and nobody can really deny that um, as a new wave of climate neutral ambition 2050 um, and as a mechanism of societies, economies, uh, families, if you may wish, decarbonization. So, um, if the Stone Age came to an end, not for a lack of stones, um, the modern day of Europe's uh, positive energy and climate conditionality that I was also referring in the beginning is usually mainstreamed from this Green Deal diplomacy that I want to emphasize in this context. One may also argue the softening also of the hard measures, hard law measures with its infringement procedures, and so on and so forth. Um, but what is very good news is that uh, just energy transition for no one living behind is basically sits in the very heart of green deal diplomacy, green deal promoting in general, um, that is basically advancing free and competitive energy market, which is very much rooted in overarching climate targets, um, again, for no one living behind. So basically with its 50, 5% uh, reduction by 2030, we can be sure, um, or at least um, excited, uh, that the carbon age is fading out um, and uh, the elements of just climate transition gaining enormous momentum accompanied by the 
appropriate financial schemes as well as, as a true motor or driver of this transformation, um, such as European Green Deal Investment Plan, Just Energy Mechanism, uh, or Next Generation EU, but uh, I am not here today for discussing the monetary dimension uh, of the Green Deal with you, as I myself, not a specialist of the financial instruments of green transition itself, but what I would like to, uh, again, devote a few more words on is basically this ideology of the Green Deal or the legal implications or potential uh, scale up, uh, potential future that it actually brings with the regions and also Europe's neighbors, which is uh, um, why I'm saying so, but it's actually because it is actually explicitly uh, mentioned in the communication. The Green Deal does not only create um, a, let's say, it does not create a, a different political or legal process, but represents EU's uh, even revitalized approach to implement this universal UN 2030 targets uh, with supplement SDGs, etc. What is more important in this context, I believe, is that clearly the Green Deal is not a purely European or rather Western European vision only. Um, instead, its continent is much larger, reflecting on the EU's strategies, uh, policies, um, laws to engage with neighbors, allies, and other partners. Therefore, um, we can argue that the Green Deal should not uh, be considered uh, as a EU policy, but rather a cooperation project as well between the EU and the neighborhood, as the effects of the climate change are global, obviously, with no nation or even international borders, and certainly cannot be mitigated in a standalone manner. Different case is adaptation, of course, but not very far away from um, that. Um, well, turning this ever biggest European decarbonization political pledge into a legal reality or legal obligation, we might need to look at already, and I would like to repeat, already enacted or existing laws with uh, the possible scenarios that may also in the future inspire a new legislative firestorm in Europe. So basically a flurry of the new regulations as well. And the logically now question comes, what this can hypothetically be based on, and the question I understand can be, um, well, not that simple in a way, it's quite complex in its nature, but simple in a way of just directly responding to what can be the basement of this new reality of decarbonization. Well, if this webinar also would have been offered just a few months back, I would have probably focused more uh, on the governance regulation, but uh, since this is not the case, we might need to look through this animal of the European climate law that Europe has recently clinched deal within the trilogue in April and a special moment or a special day, you may call it today, because yesterday actually the Council also was ending this, uh, this uh, saga and adoption of the, even procedurally the adoption um, of the European climate law is there um, with also amending uh, the, the government's regulation. So basically this, this couple of catchphrases or the political declarations on the launch of the climate law is now behind, such as, for example, the law of laws, the landmark moment of Europe, um, et cetera, which is, of course, very good or nice or good, but we might also need to unlock it a little bit better from inside. <clears throat> so for my voice. Um, so, unlocking climate law, then, um, it is certainly um, a cornerstone of the European Green Deal. Again, nobody can really doubt on that. It is, for the lawyers in this virtual audience today, it is a regulation and not a directive. So, obviously, immediately applicable to the member states based on 192 TFEU um, that sets the frame for the EU climate related legislation, what is important for that. 30 years to come, um, we have the targets, obviously binding targets for, 2020, for 2050, carbon neutrality, also binding target for 2030 uh, uh, for, uh, for 5050, and also um, there is an intermediate target coming up for 2040 um, by 20, uh, 2023 at the first global stock change of the Paris Agreement. So basically what is also very important to, to note in this context is that uh, we are now talking on this, um, let's say, uh, collectivized target, um, col uh, 
like a common realization of the targets by the member states um, and not the individual members committing uh, to the uh, to the to the specific targets. So basically, this can also be partially assessed as uh, some sort of drawback of the climate law, um, coupled with some other issues such as, for example, soft measures of the enforcement um, without real sanction rules um, and so on and so forth. But some other good aspects as well public participation, for example, and also overly very ambitious movement, of course, with this fairness and solidarity elements as well. So some member states, of course, can be a little bit ahead in these processes, while others can also jump on the boat of the decarbonization um, uh, to the extent possible and, and as fast as possible. Well, um, now, um, uh, just to look through uh, the energy community contract in Paris, we still have time for that. No matter how much we talk on the drawbacks of the climate law, European Green Deal and the climate law would certainly have a very strong impact on the contract in Paris. Um, of course, due to their approximation to the EU a key in these areas. Um, as we are talking that it's uh, at the moment, uh, um, impacts with an indirect manner by using the soft power elements, diplomacy mentioned above, uh, and with this philosophical influence uh, uh, on local norm, make, norm making, um, which also at some point goes against the efforts and the spirits of energy community as well, with the variety of the hard law instruments. Again, it is to argue that uh, um, it is a very important step ahead. And if the modern value of the European diplomacy um, is accepting these soft measures, then it is certainly much better than, than, than nothing. Um, just to also um, see the concrete pillars of measuring uh, the impacts uh, or rather impact assessment, we might also need to look at a uh, specific case study. And in this context, you probably wouldn't be surprised if I bring up George an example. Um, maybe first via the lens of the Paris Agreement, which has not been ratified by the parliament, but still approved by the government, so legally binding force. Then in legal uh, terms, the Paris Agreement mandates Georgia to implement NDC target as the first ever international commitment. Well, if the first NDC was presented in, obviously INDC was presented in 2015, we now have the new measures, new vision of the country. Um, uh, Georgia has presented its uh, second NDC by um, uh, 2021. It has recently been adopted in April in Georgia. And according to this new vision, we are talking about unconditional target of 35% below pre-industrial level. And what is also important to note is that uh, um, back to back, um, climate strategy 2030 and the climate action plan 2021, 2031 has been also adopted in the country. So basically um, what it means, it means that the implementation of the Paris Agreement um, and all these political pledges require um, alignments of already assumed obligations in the domestic legal system. So basically we are again talking on the association agreement and energy community laws, uh, but this is obviously not all. The approval of the Paris also is an important legal avenue for um, meeting UNFCCC requirements um, um, as it largely relies on robust um, transparency and, and, and accounting system as well. Um, and while we are talking on the climate elements, we should certainly not forget that Georgia is still really uh, lagging behind when it comes to MRV system development, um, which is also a next step in order to achieve um, um, realization of these decarbonization pledges by certain uh, timeline. Well, on top of that, the mechanism that I also would like to mention in this context and emphasize um, that may also lead to the national implementation of the European Green Deal is called clean energy package, so the fourth energy package, or the winter package, if you may wish, with uh, which EU um, has already completed the comprehensive update of its energy policy framework. Um, but I must say that this development, nonetheless, has non-legally binding nature on Georgia. 
Um, and country is not yet subject to an updated targets of the EU, as we also have no energy community individual or collective targets in place, maybe towards the end of 2021. But on that, maybe other people in this virtual audience can speak better uh, and to give some indications on what could happen in the near future. So basically, the two ways possible of how and when the new European legislation takes mandatory legal effect upon Georgia and, and, and some other contracting parties, that is obviously European Commission making the formal proposal in the Energy Community Ministerial Council, and the Council adopts um, a new targets, same triple targets as in the EU. So we are talking on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and obviously greenhouse gas reduction. So basically the same category, which can of course be at a later point adjustable, but but um, this idea of, of, of national targets versus EU targets or versus energy community collective or individual targets is already important to put up at this point. Maybe the easiest way also how the Green Deal impacts on uh, local lawmaking is the revision of the association agreement because there is a certain procedure for that uh, applicable, available, um, which can also be called a uh, dynamic approximation, but uh, that is also a different story that I want that I don't want to maybe talk more on that aspect in this context. But what I would like to again mention is this aspect of planning. Although Georgia is not, uh, as, as said above, um, bound to the governance regulation, it is still um, uh, in the position to submit national energy plans as the ministerial uh, council recommendation. And uh, in this process, I would be advocating, obviously, for more streamlining. There is some other sound coming up into my ears, yeah. Um, streamlining together with a unit triple C and Paris Agreement commitments and processes, obviously market-based approach and, and schemes compatible to EU are key and the state aid rules and auctioning system guarantees of origin. We already have um, the, the standard, uh, let's say, provisions in, in, in Georgian uh, recently adopted renewable energy law on that, but obviously the schemes need to be developed at a supplementary legal uh, stage, but this is also yet to come. This can be, of course, then later on added by a carbon pricing or, well, for example, carbon tax or joint emission trading uh, schemes with the EU and the controlling parties of the energy community. But of course, again, this is the next layer, which obviously includes a lot of cooperation with, uh, with uh, like-minded partners and uh, energy community secretariat. Of course, uh, that are, but I would say that is certainly not all. Um, hurting the cats, I would say the stakeholder involvement at all levels, at uh, um, all possible uh, constellation, whether this is national, regional, or international, <clears throat> makes up the decisive part of the successful energy sector reform and decarbonization pathway. As I believe, no one can whistle harmony, but it actually takes the whole orchestra to play it. Well, um, just uh, very briefly, three things in the end, and then uh, I would be finishing my uh, presentation uh, today. Well, COVID-19, hydrogen and cities dimension or, or component, lessons learned from the failure of 2008 financial crisis recovery. The European Green Deal has been tabled by the Commission right before the pandemic, and then it has turned out that coronavirus is not a health crisis anymore, but it unfortunately affects every field of human activity endeavor, like Green Deal does as well. So it is hugely important that uh, there will be no two recoveries of the world, but one giant green recovery um, as it is actually expected as well. Hydrogen, when we are talking on um, the fast and successful decarbonization Obviously, new products or new approaches matter a lot, where, in my opinion, hydrogen finds its special locus uh, or place. Green hydrogen, as opposed to, to grey or, or uh, the blue one, can be an answer to many questions on this decarbonization uh, agenda, especially to the sectors which are hard to electrify, um, such as industry, transport, especially long-haul transport, and also power generation. Well, it is certainly a long way with hydrogen to go, but uh, already looking at the options of this within the energy community parties is, in my opinion, very important. So, for example, in Georgia, there have been some studies or assessments already taking place, but uh, 
the, 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 I would say much is yet to come with that regard. Um, and the last component, as I was briefly um, indicated just a few seconds ago, um, whatever the carbonization strategies or, op or options in general we discuss within this new framework of energy law, within this new energy law 2.0 with climate, environment, digitalization, decarbonization, whichever format we use for that, we should never forget what matters the most uh, in the end. This is basically the city's component as well as a sub nation actors standing at the very forefront of combating climate change and ramping up green energy in general. Um, usually cities are blamed for majority of the greenhouse gases, gas emissions, which is which is not entirely entirely a lie because this also comes with this rapid urbanization um, as today's trend and also a risk. <clears throat> With that, uh, um, we then therefore need to already think very heavily um, with the nation governments, with the local authorities sitting together, cooperating, and 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 uh, and thinking of uh, how much resilience we in general put in cities, how much we bring citizens and communities in general together, um, whether this is in the EU on its or its uh, neighborhood, and basically everywhere together for, I would say, uh, low carbon, just, fair, um, gender neutral, and of course, sustainable decarbonized future. Um, I think that was all uh, that I wanted to um, um, express or talk in front of you today. Obviously, you've got my contacts now on this slide. And I would be, of course, very happy if you get in touch with me on uh, possible follow up questions, whether in this format today again or in a different mode. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, back to you, Dirk.